All right, I'm back with Dr. Steven Siner, and we did an interview earlier where he was interviewing me. Check it out, it was a lot of fun. Steven's one of my oldest friends, and he also is the founder of Aerojo Technologies. This is really awesome because it was a company that is based upon some material science projects that he did while he was in college, and one of them was with me where we did a project for the NASA Reduced Gravity, Student Re Reduced Gravity Program. I don't know what the official name is, something like that. Reduced Gravity Student Flight Opportunities Program. Yes, exactly. It's not around anymore, but it was an epic program that allowed students like us. It's when still around in a slightly different form, but yeah, it's not quite like it was when we were there, yeah. It was, it was really cool. It was, it was, I mean, the chance to be able to fly in zero gravity and do science was, a pretty awesome opportunity. We won multiple national competitions to be able to do that. And then you went to NASA Academy, I went to NASA Academy, and you got connected with powerful people, I think through the Academy, that allowed you to become now, what, a, a flight director for Zero Gravity Corporation. That's right, yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me uh, here today, Nick. Yeah, so I uh, do a couple things in my life. I'm primarily the president and CEO of Aerogel Technologies. So my company makes ultralight materials that are 10 times lighter than plastics uh, to make airplanes, cars, and buildings more efficient. Um, but uh, in my other life, I moonlight as a flight director for Zero Gravity Corporation. So um, uh, as we did when we were undergrads, flying on an aircraft that does uh, parabolic arc, so plane goes up, plane goes down, repeat. Uh, it creates instances of weightlessness for the passengers inside the plane, um, for training astronauts, for people who want to experience the thrill of zero gravity um, for movies. Um, so I, I work in the back of the plane and I'm in charge of safety and managing um, uh, passengers, helping have a smooth and excellent flight. Um, so between those two things, I keep pretty busy. But yeah, Zero-G is, is exactly why I'm here. I, I just flew here in Las Vegas and uh, used it as an opportunity to spend some time with uh, my good friend Nick and his wife Amber. And I noticed that while I've known you, you've gone through some amazing transformations. You mean, you, you were somebody who was focused mostly on caring about your science and focusing a lot less on academics to becoming so academic, I think you got what, like a full ride to MIT or like a scholarship? Yeah, so, well, getting, yeah, so I, uh, I think that was a fair characterization when I was in college. Um, I was much more interested in, in sort of my projects and doing science and doing engineering, um, you know, as I wanted to do it, as opposed to doing homework and studying for tests as much as I probably should have. So I didn't, I didn't have a great grade point average as an undergrad. I was, uh, I was, you know, better than a B student, but I wasn't an A student. Uh, and when I applied to grad school, I was really, I really wanted to get my PhD. I really wanted to do transformational science, you know, go to space, um, save the world. And um, I really felt PhD was the way to do that. And I applied to grad school and uh, MIT uh, accepted me. It was just a, a tremendous opportunity. And I've had to work uh, really, really hard uh, to kind of catch up in terms of um, being able to perform uh, in, in classes and, and to succeed at MIT. Uh, and so I did get my PhD. I was in the Department of Material Science and Engineering for my master's degree, and then I went into the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, for my PhD. And so um, I, I've actually worked in six different departments uh, ranging from biological engineering to electrical engineering, computer science, and ultimately um, I'm, a, I'm a chemist. I know about atoms and molecules, uh, and so as a materials chemist, I can kind of work in any department because everything's made out of atoms and molecules. Uh, so what I do now is I'm really interested in, in helping make, uh, make the world better, solving the world's grand challenges, and enabling spacefaring civilization, and material science is a great way to do that. Yeah, I, when, I, when people are listening to you, they probably think, wow, this guy knows a lot of sh stuff. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of science crazy stuff, especially uh, if you're not a scientist. And um, the cool science crazy stuff that you're doing, though, is also like the super cool science stuff. I mean, you're, you're doing crazy experiments with your gravity, you're on the Penn and Teller show with like a, a flamethrower yeah. <laughs> being shot at you behind this wall yeah. that you made. Probably should have been uh, a little more job. terrifying than, <laughs> yeah. than it was. <laughs> to like, uh, I, I remember you were talking about projects that you were on, like space elevator yep. and supporting that and um, trying to build an elevator and go into space or working on crazy projects with Peter Diamantis and uh, now like uh, ho hosting corporate space flight programs for 
like Stephen Hawking's. Well, I can't take any credit for that. I was part of a team. I was yeah. just the flight attendant on that flight. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess uh, the the point you're getting to is that I, you know, I like to do cool science, and that's absolutely true. I've always been attracted to cool science, and um, uh, it's real easy to get into academia and to now get holed up on a project and get really pigeonholed and, and now kind of lose sight of, of what you're doing and why it matters. And, and maybe it's just because I have a short attention span. Maybe it's because I played a lot of video games when I was little. Maybe it's because I watched a lot of Star Trek. But I've always really um, felt it was important to, um, to work on science that was immediately um, relevant and relatable to, to everyone. And so um, things like aerogels, the world's lightest solid materials, and I worked on carbon nanotubes and graphene, the world's strongest materials. Uh, I'm interested in diamond, you know, synthetic diamond. I'm interested in um, space materials. You know, these are these are the kinds of sci-fi futuristic things that you know we were all promised. You know, I I remember a friend of mine, Loretta Whiteside, said uh, when she was little, she remembered her kindergarten teacher telling her that we would all live in cities on the moon one day. But what she didn't tell her was that we were going to have to build those cities ourselves. And that was something that I, I stuck with me and I think about a lot is that, you know, you've probably heard this phrase, the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. You know, I, as, you know in my, my world, I, I'm not particularly excited by politics. I don't feel like there's a heck of a lot I can do outside of the democratic process to really influence politics. But what I can do is to, to work really hard and, and to, to build communities of, of people um, to, to study myself and to experiment uh, and, to, and to take the risks that are necessary to develop technologies that to make the world better. Um, so that's kind of why I think I get interested in these things like space elevator and aerogels is because they're things that I see as being pathways um, to creating a really exciting future and I want to be part of it. When I was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison studying engineering, I would hear from other scientists about how business and people who are studying business was kind of like the enemy. Yet yeah. At the same time, <laughs> you have to be a business executive and a scientist. I was wondering about how you've reconciled that somewhat of a paradox that's common throughout the minds of scientists. Yeah, you know, honestly, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I know that um, perception you're talking about um, is out there, and, and it's actually, uh, I think, dead wrong. Um, as scientists, like in the purest case, a professor at a university who's doing science, and let's say she or he's got some fantastic idea and, and you know, some really talented students to work on it, in order to make that science happen, there's got to be money. There's got to be funding. There's got to be support. And so, you know, any good science professor has got to master uh, the art of writing proposals and, and being compelling and delivering her message to audiences that um, need to be brought on board in order for her to be able to move forward. And so when I think about business, I think about science, you know, there is such an important overlap in terms of being able to communicate, articulate, uh, and really dial down the whole uh, program into its core components. What really matters? How do we fund this? How do we compel people to support us to do this? In business, it's the same thing. The value propositions are a little bit different. In, in academia, what we're doing is we're, we've got ideas, we're trying to get people to give us money to develop those ideas into uh, you know, better knowledge. In business, in material science business, it's oftentimes exactly the same, but it tends to be the same process a little bit further down the development path. So we'll have a technology that say has already been fleshed out in a university or something that we've developed internally that looks pretty promising. Now what we have to do, and it's actually a little bit scarier than academia in my opinion, is go out to the world and say, we have a thing and it's gonna cost you money, but it's an awesome thing and it's gonna create amazing value for you. If you take a risk with us, you believe in this technology, Let's, let's work on this together. Let's take that next step. The great opportunity that exists as uh, an entrepreneurial scientist is now to see that those things that you were mixing in beakers late at night in your lab, those technologies that were an idea in your head, 
are now flying on airplanes, saving airlines billions of dollars a year in fuel, or um, making our world uh, able to use forms of energy we weren't able to access 50 years ago, five years ago, um, you know, five months ago even. And so I think as, as an entrepreneurial scientist, it, it's, it's very evident that, you know, the two worlds of science and business are really not that different. With a good engineering and science mindset, you should be able to run uh, a business very effectively, provided uh, the very important um, skill set of taking a risk. As a very busy CEO and also a very talented person, if you had to relive a day over and over and over again, like the movie Groundhog's Day, until something was accomplished and then you would go to the next day, what would that be? Uh, that's a really good question. I love the movie Groundhog's Day, so it's, it's a good one to ask me. I think, and it's probably true of, of everyone uh, out there, that uh, you know, I've got a lot of internal prejudices, barriers, you know, things that I think, oh, that's not possible or that's not, you know, not going to happen or I can't do that or whatever. I have some thing in my mind that, that prevents me from taking a, a risk or, or doing something that uh, has got to get done. And uh, I think in, in my Groundhog's Day, I'd be living it over and over again until like I've sort of released myself of those inhibitions and I'm like, you know, okay, I can do this. and, and uninhibited by my own internal monologue of, of what is um, possible and, and what I can do. I think that that's a really tough uh, breakthrough to have. I think people spend their entire lives trying to have that breakthrough. I think other people never have that breakthrough. Uh, but it's something I think about a lot is, you know, where am I creating artificial barriers that are preventing from, you know, preventing me, preventing us, preventing the world from doing something, and, and particularly, you know, let's take the example of the warp drive, right? I think the warp drive is a great example of a technology that if it existed, would be uh, very transformational um, to our society and to the universe in general. There are a lot of people out there that strongly feel that it's not possible. There are many people out there that feel it is possible, but outside of the reach of our technology. And uh, I like to think that something like the warp drive is within our reach. Um, if we don't take that mindset and it is possible, we're going to miss the opportunity to do something amazing. If we do take that mindset and it isn't possible, we're still going to do amazing things trying to get there uh, despite the fact that it, it's not an attainable goal. I think one example, a scientific example that, that's kind of cool, it's a little nerdy, so put your, you know, uh, nerd hats on for a minute. So uh, molecules, right? These are the fundamental components of everything around us. The chairs we're sitting on, the air we're breathing, the grass underneath us. Everything is made of molecules, right? So as scientists, we design new molecules. We study molecules. We're very interested in isolating molecules, drugs, you know, our, our novel molecules, plastics, you know, um, perhaps something that's uh, found in nature that has amazing properties. Uh, and, and so the idea that you could take one molecule, this itty bitty tiny thing that's you know, maybe 10 or 20 atoms, smallest unit of, uh, of matter that, that we really work with in the world, and to, to probe it, to measure that molecule, to study a single molecule by itself, uh, was considered just outside of the the realm of possibility, just too technically complex, maybe even physically not possible. Um, but uh, in the past 15 years, this technology called single molecule spectroscopy was developed, and where we can actually take a single molecule on a, on a wafer, and we can probe it, we can learn all about this molecule, one tiny itty bitty molecule. And uh, I remember hearing a talk from a professor from Columbia University talking about the technology that went into uh, single molecule spectroscopy. And when you see the machine, the apparatus it used to study single molecules, it's basically a microscope and some lasers, and it's a very straightforward setup as, as far as uh, university goes. And he said, there's no reason we couldn't have been doing this in the 80s. No one sat down and did the math and decided it was possible. It took us 25 years uh, from the point when that technology was 
available to us to, to, to when people actually were doing it because they thought it was possible. So let's think about the rest of the world like that. What else out there is possible that we are putting artificial barriers in front of us uh, and is preventing us from getting there? That's, I think, one of the hardest challenges we have both as scientists and entrepreneurs. Well, it sounds like some of the ways you would probably spend your time is solving scientific challenges and problems and getting solutions. At the same time, you also mentioned there's inhibitions that you thought that you should overcome. What are those? My inhibitions? Yeah, I think one of the inhibitions that uh, it's taken me a long time to, to overcome is you know being able to uh, ask people for money. I think that's one of the hardest things as an entrepreneur, some people are really good at it. I, I wasn't. I've always had the mindset of, you know, really uh, having to earn um, money and to really, you know, work hard and, and, you know, asking for too much money. I've always kind of felt you know, bad about that. But what I've seen, and, and, and my, my business is a little unusual, we actually uh, bootstrapped um, our whole company. Uh, we've taken a very small amount of investment, but you know, it's a very small percentage against millions of dollars in market-derived revenue that we've put back into the research and development of our products. And, and you know, that, that model is a very powerful one. It's a very new one uh, and a very old one at the same time, ironically. Um, but it's very different from the sort of fundamentals that are taught in business schools and in uh, universities about how you're supposed to start businesses and venture capital and angel investment, all these things. And so in that regard, um, you know, I, I kind of avoided the problem of having to ask for money because I went to the market and had people um, compelled by products we were able uh, to make early enough that we didn't really have to ask anyone for a lot of money. And, uh, and, and, and over time, as we've developed uh, part of our business we call Custom Solutions, which is delivering technology to companies and to uh, researchers that uh, is not off the shelf, but within our portfolio of capability, um, you know, trying to, to ask a fair price is, is a really tricky game. What we find is that you know, we have a sense of how much we would want to pay if we were those scientists, we get a sense from talking to them what their budgets are and, and what they're willing to pay. And at the end of the day, material science is really expensive. The consumables, the time scale involved, the labor, um, the energy, the water, all the things that goes into it, you know, we have to accommodate for, for all, of, all of this stuff. And so we've had to become comfortable over time um, proposing prices for our services that are maybe more than people really want to pay, but really what is needed to deliver the technology well and to deliver it in a timely fashion. So that, that's a, a skill that I've had to learn. And now going out as our company is scaling up to millions of square feet of um, these advanced materials per year uh, production, um, you know, going out and finding that money and, and, and forging those alliances and creating those relationships, you know, that's, that's an ongoing challenge I think that a lot of entrepreneurs will face. And, and it's particularly hard for us uh, at the risk of, you know, reinforcing my own um, self-justification about why things are hard. But our, our industry is not, uh, is not uh, well understood by many investors. America's investment community is not ready for materials and chemical technologies. Um, most of the investments out there are calibrated to Silicon Valley timescales. The idea of Moore's laws applies to computers and software, iPhone apps, uh, you know, Android apps, software. These things have fast iteration cycles. People uh, can write some code, they can run it, they can break it, they can fix it in you know, a few seconds, a few minutes, run it again, and they have a, a, an iteration cycle on the order of, of seconds to minutes. In a company like mine, we are uh, fundamentally restricted by the chemical time scale of materials. Chemical reactions can only be sped up so fast. There are, uh, molecules have to diffuse through other molecules. This makes things like uh, drug development and you know, new polymer development slower inherently than developing technologies that are run on computers. And so because we haven't had a huge economic boom 
centered around breakthroughs in material science the way that we have over the past few decades with computers and software. Venture capital funds are typically structured for five to ten years. Um, however, the average industry internal rate of return for materials technologies is between 11 to 18 years. But the ROI is 8x, so it is worth investing in material science, but most of the investors out there don't have the financial uh, experience and capability to invest in those kind of technologies. So for companies like us, we've really had to think hard about how we get this money. Is it through government grants? Is it through market derived revenue? Is it through angel investors with those long-term mindsets? And that's something that's a, a continual challenge for us. What are you doing to build the relationships you need to take your company to the next level? One of the things that we did was to identify people that other companies in our position would traditionally consider as competitors. The established companies. So our, our company makes materials called aerogels. They're ultralight materials. There are several other companies in the world, leading co companies, public companies, making aerogels. Early on, I recognized we were never going to be able to compete with them and that we weren't really doing the same things as they were. We were just as a plastic bag and a bulletproof vest both exploit the amazing materials properties of polymers, uh, but are very different technologies. We are deriving value from this platform of materials we call aerogels. However, the materials are different enough in various forms that we can address different market opportunities. So we recognized early on it was smart for us uh, and beneficial for the world to partner with the companies that were already at scale, at market, you know, doing great things with aerogel and, and to be their friends and, and to, to partner with them, uh, to partner with organizations like NASA that are doing incredible aerogel research uh, as opposed to considering them as a scientific competitor, uh, competitor that we need to beat. Uh, that mindset of, of creating those partnerships has really set us up. It's driven a lot of customers our way that you know are looking for value in those organizations that, that they aren't able to deliver because of the nature of their products that we are able to deliver. It's given us access to technologies and to accelerating research and development uh, in a way that is much more cost effective and much, much more time effective than us trying to do that all on our own. Um, using inbound marketing, we can't give materials away for free like you can give software trials away for free, but what we could do is give away information. So we created a platform called aerogel.org where we taught the world how to make aerogels and, and to show them that these things are accessible in your garage if you're committed enough and you read up enough and you're safe enough. Uh, and so by, by doing that, that, uh, that created a space in the internet where people who are interested in this technology and the possibilities of this technology could learn more. And when they saw a possibility in their world that they would not be able to implement themselves because it's, it's, it's hard, um, that we were there to help them out. And so inbound marketing became a very valuable strategy for us and very, very unusual in material science. Uh, and so now what we're doing is, is for the first time, uh, now that our company has, has these technical breakthroughs, we're now able to mass produce uh, large sizes and quantities of ultralight plastics replacements, 10 times lighter than plastics, more insulating than styrofoam, a thousand times more soundproofing than any other uh, material over um, um, in many, in, uh, many ways. Um, these uh, these materials, these products we can make now, we're now able to kind of go out and do an outbound push, go talk to people that don't know what they don't know about these products and to know what we've learned from our inbound marketing database and to go and find customers that we think will be interested in our products. We use that inbound marketing to inform us on how we should develop these products and now we've got things that we know if we go out people are going to be willing to buy. So getting to the point where we were comfortable to do outbound marketing took us many years because we felt 
we only stood to lose opportunity by being too early uh, pushing sales when our technology wasn't developed and our production wasn't developed. Now that we have those things in place, this is sort of the next phase of our business is really outbound push to get this out there to the rest of the world. Awesome. We just played a round of golf. I think it's time to uh, end an interview. And uh, yep. thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. And uh, thanks for hosting me in your beautiful house here in Las Vegas. And uh, I'm looking forward to all the great projects that uh, you've got going on and, and uh, great things in your world. Cheers.